here. How are we all doing today? We're doing good. Well, we're so grateful you're here joining us this morning. Uh, let's stand together. It's a good Friday today, obviously, and uh, yeah, let's just take a moment to, uh, to center ourselves and to focus on him, and uh, I'll just pray to, to start us out. Oh well, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, this day that we can come here uh, th to church to celebrate you, to celebrate uh, what happened on Good Friday. Wow, what a day. Oh, I just love the name of it. Because what happened, like we are remembering what happened. And part of, part of us is filled with a little bit of sadness, but but it is good what happened. That sacrifice that you made, it was so necessary. And the outcome of what happened, your love poured out for us, means that we can be with you. We thank you so much for that. Help us to, to be in the right mindset this morning as we reflect on what you've done for us and as we worship you. Let's sing together. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dark with you acquainted with our grief, a man of sorrow, son of suffering, oh, blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps, that there's a God who bleeds, oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Freedom, your stripes, my healing. 
There's a God who pleases. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Oh, hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we thank you.
innocent Savior Broken and bleeding for us The nails in His hands Thorns on His brow Rivers of mercy endlessly flowing down The Son of God, high and lifted up The Father's love came pouring down for us He has
sacrifice he made for us. I pray that that would be so real to us every day, that we would know that, that you bought us with a price. That price was, was so real. It was something real that happened. It wasn't just a story. Jesus shedding his blood for us. Oh God, we thank you. Pray we would remember this every day. In the name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can never see. Well, this Easter season, we've been following on the heels of a series in the parables from the book of Luke. And today we're going to be actually in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to that passage, we'll be taking a look at the crucifixion account, or pardon me, Luke chapter 23, I should say. We'll be taking a look at the crucifixion account there. When we talked about the Lord's triumphal entry in the service last week. We referenced a prophecy in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 9 verse 9 is a very well-known passage. It talks about our king coming to us lowly and humble on a colt on the foal of a donkey, right? And then we talked about God's plan being greater than our plan and how the people who are worshiping Jesus, they called him Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. That they didn't fully understand what that all meant. And we realized that just a few days later, Jesus would be crucified. When you look at the prophecy in Zechariah, however, and you look at the entirety of that book, because remember, for the Jewish people, their Bibles weren't the New Testament. They were just the Old Testament. That's what they had. So they don't have well known the prophecies in books like Zechariah. We don't read Zechariah as much as we read Luke, right? We read Luke a lot more, don't we? But when we look at the prophecy in Zechariah, we realize that they're still not ready to accept their king. You read through Zechariah, you realize that the people of Israel are still far away from God at that time. And we know that during Jesus' day, that the people of Israel are still far away from him. And many people accepted his message, but many more rejected it. And then there's this verse in Zechariah 12, verse 10. It talks about a future event where Israel will finally get it, where they will finally come to their senses, where they will finally understand what they've done. And it's both prophecy about what would happen during the life of Jesus, the Messiah, and also what would happen in their future. And it's this verse in Zechariah 12, verse 10. It says, They will mourn over the one whom they have pierced as a father mourns over a newborn son. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't lost a child. But anybody that's lost a child understands a pain that we don't really grasp for those of us that haven't gone through that. And especially when a child dies in infancy or a newborn child, it's the worst kind of pain. And what the prophecy there in Zechariah is speaking about is how that pain is so real, it's like it pierces us, piercing our skin. And when we think about the cross, 
We wonder, why did Jesus choose? Why did God choose this method of execution or death? And one of the reasons is, I think, very clearly that it is so graphic and it is so powerful. How was Jesus fastened to the cross? He was fastened to the cross with these with giant spikes. And when we talk about the cross, the question I have for you this morning is, does the cross pierce you? Does it bring you to the point of understanding how much it cost God? To think of one of these spikes being put through my flesh, impaling me to a piece of wood, and hanging there till I die, Can you imagine a worse kind of death? A worse kind of death from physical torture, but a worse kind of death from humiliation in front of other people? Think about it. What happened to Jesus? He was mocked and he was cruelly treated. And he chose this kind of death. He chose to be pierced. So today I want to go through Luke chapter 23 and I want us to look look at Jesus' trial and his crucifixion. And I want to ask some questions about the cross and how it pierces us or does it pierce us. I want to pick it up in Luke chapter 23 and read verses 1 to 4 to start. Then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, and they began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming that he's the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you've said it. Pilate turned to the leading priests and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. What was going on here? The council had decided it was time for Jesus to die. Why? Because he was interrupting their plans. Their plans were to be great and they were to be powerful and they were to be important. They were scheming for positions of influence in the council. We called them the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leading council. There was positions of influence and there was rabbis who would be recognized by their peers. And Jesus came along and the first thing he did was Just like this spike, he pierced their plans. And that's what the cross does, is it pierces our plans as well. Pierces them. It cuts to the heart of what our plans in life are all about. So what's your plan for life? Maybe you're not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Maybe you're not trying to work your way to the top of some kind of political position. But we've all got plans The most tragic part of all of this was these plans that they had for their life. They weren't the plans that were going to ever last for eternity. They were only temporary plans. But they made those plans and they expected that those plans would be fulfilled. And how many times have we made plans in our life and then God's come along and allowed something to happen and pierced our plan, cut through it, nailed it, as it were, to that cross, and we become angry at him. I want to talk about an ancillary passage in John chapter 11. And I want us to read these verses. It says, Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. What happened? Well, they were with Mary. What's happening in John 11? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now the miracles are getting out of hand. It's one thing to heal blind people. It's one thing for him to cast out demons. It's one thing for him to maybe even feed a whole bunch of people. But to raise somebody who has been in the grave for four days, that's just getting out of hand. And it says many of the people who were with Mary, who was a brother or sister of Lazarus, believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do They asked each other, this man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, 
Soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple, Greek, meaning our place, and our nation. And from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. They weren't concerned about God receiving glory. They were concerned about their plans not being interrupted. They weren't concerned about the Messiah coming to save them. They already were in bed with the Romans. They had an arrangement already. They were on the top. Why would they want someone to come and save them when they don't feel that they need to be saved? When we're so busy pursuing our plans, we can forget that those plans are temporary. And when we forget that those plans are temporary, God loves us enough to come and to pierce those plans just like a nail pierces our flesh. Maybe you've been through something like that. You've had plans, plans for your life, your career, your marriage, your kids, your finances, your health. And then God comes along and he pierces that and it hurts Kind of like a nail going through you. In the end, this cross piercing our plans ends up bringing us to the point of asking the question whether or not we truly believe that we need the cross or whether we're good on our own. Look at what these people did. Let's go back to Luke 23, verse 2. They began to state their case This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay taxes to the Roman government. Now, the second part was the part that they were really upset about. But they didn't mention that because they're going before the Roman government and they want to present something that would be acceptable to them. They lied. They flat out lied. Jesus never said that. He said, render unto Caesar... The, th- the things that are Caesar's and God, the, s- the things that are God's. He never said, don't pay your taxes. They lied. Apparently, Pilate didn't believe them. Because if Pilate believed them, he would have had Jesus crucified. It's kind of like today. If you want to get in trouble with the Canadian government, you can do a lot of things. But failure to pay your taxes is one of the tops, right? The government will go after you and after you and after you, right? They will. Governments do not like it when people don't pay their taxes. And the Romans were no different. But they didn't believe this. It was a lie. Why this deception? Because they knew that the real reason they wanted him to be executed wouldn't pass Roman muster. And when the cross confronts our plans, do we do something similar like this? Do we rebel like the Pharisees did? Do we stay honest or do we creatively work at a way to circumvent God's commands? God's plans run afoul of our plans And then we have a choice to make. It pierces our plans, and we have a choice to make. When God tells us that his plans are greater than ours and his thoughts are greater than ours, do we actually believe that? The cross brings us to that that point. Second part of this shows up in Luke chapter 23, verse 6. And it's the presumptions that happen when we start to put our plans above God's plans, when we start to put our own desires above the Lord's. But the cross also pierces those presumptions as well. After this, he gets sent to King Herod. Now, Herod and Pilate, up to this point, aren't friends. Herod is a descendant of King Herod, the great King Herod that we read about in Jesus' birth. This is a descendant of his And then in verse 6 we read, oh, he's a Galilean, because they tell him he's from Galilee. Pilate asked, and when they said that he was, Pilate sent him to Herod Antipas because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction. And Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. Oh, this is great. So Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. And he asked Jesus a question after question, but Jesus refused to answer 
Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Then Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. And finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. And it says, after that, Herod and Pilate became friends. Look at verse 8 again. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. In other words, a show. He presumed that Jesus would dance to his tune. But what did the cross do? The cross pierced his presumptions because what did Jesus do in response to all of these demands? He was silent. How many times have we demanded stuff of God? And he's been silent. Have you ever demanded anything of God? You said, you need to do this. This has to happen. And this has to happen by such and such a time. And it doesn't happen. And then you get angry. And then you fall into disbelief. What did Herod do? His anger showed up and he started mocking Jesus and then ridiculing him and then gave him a royal robe. Oh, you think you're a king? Ha, ha, ha. And he gave him a crown He gave him a royal robe, I should say here in this passage. He gave him a robe and he's like, you think you're the king? And we know he got a crown of thorns. Many people today follow Jesus for what they presume he will do for them. Their expectations are you better do this or I won't worship you. You better do this or I'm not going to be a part of your plan and what you're doing. You better do this or I'll stop believing God, you must do this. And you must do it now. It's a big thing. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, all authority, all absolute power of rule, or rule, power of absolute rule in the Amplified Version. I love that version because it really explains things deeper. It says, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm not here to answer your questions to your satisfaction, Herod. Antipas, And if he's not going to answer it to some king, he's not going to answer it to us. And we say, God, why? It hurts. I need this. I presume that you love me. If you love me, you will do the following. And he doesn't do it in the timing that we want. But what does the cross present us with? It pierces those presumptions. The cross also pierces our pretenses. Pilate comes over and he picks, he picks it up, and, and, and there's a trial. What was the point of having a trial? What is the point of having a trial? It's to do what? The point of having a trial is for us to be able to have justice, right? That's the point of the whole thing. And the Romans, they wanted to at least give some kind of, I guess, veneer of justice. And this justice demanded that Jesus be free. When we look at the verses in Luke 23, verses 13 to 15, let's take a look at what happened that next. It said, Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I've examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence And I find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. Pharisees, they lied. They thought that their think about the taxes would get Jesus in trouble. Pilate didn't believe it. They said, well, he says he's king of the Jews. Pilate's like, so? I don't care. Well, he's going to lead a revolt against Rome. And then he looks at it and goes, I don't see any of that. He's, he hasn't done anything wrong. Even Herod Antipas says that he hasn't done anything wrong. But the Pharisees didn't want justice, did they? What did they want? They wanted murder. But they didn't, they didn't want to be seen as people who want murder because murder is immoral. Murder breaks the, one of the great Ten Commandments, right? The Sixth Commandment breaks it. They know it's wrong, but they were overwhelmed with jealousy of Jesus. Remember what they said in John 11? Like, we, we got to stop this guy. He's going to ruin everything. And that's what the cross does. 
is the cross ruins everything. It ruins everything for us because we think we're pretty good people. We think we deserve a pretty good life. You talk to the average person and you say, what do you think you deserve? Nobody's gonna say, I deserve hell, right? Nobody ever says that. People don't say that they deserve horror. I mean, there's a few people out there who are stuck in a really bad state, but most people don't say, I deserve some horrible punishment that's eternal. And the cross pierces our pretenses because we pretend to be moral. We're very good at this. Have you ever seen anybody in our society do what we call performative justice? Any of that? You guess what the term performative justice is? It's kind of like this. I love the environment so much. I bought a Ford with an EcoBoost. You see that little green leaf on the side of my truck? There it is. It's proof. I love the planet. I'm a good person. I bought an EcoBoost. 2012 EcoBoost, right? Back in the day. Remember the little green leaf, right? So I'm an environmentalist now because I bought a Ford F-150 with the EcoBoost instead of that gas-guzzling five liter like all those other sinners out there. Do we live in a world of performative justice? Sure we do. And it cycles through. Hashtag this, hashtag that, right? Hashtag the latest thing. But do you really care? The Pharisees were all about performative justice, but they were underneath it all full of jealousy and rage. Do we ever get jealous? Jealous of others. Have you ever been jealous of somebody else? Do you live in a society where people are jealous of each other? It's not fair. They got this and I didn't get that. It's not fair. It's not fair. How come I got shortchanged and they got the right end of the stick? How many people are angry at God because they got the short end of the stick and somebody that didn't obviously deserved worse got better? Anybody ever been there? Felt that? I think that's pretty common to our human experience. But the cross pierces our pretenses, exposes our sin. And it hangs it on the cross for everybody to see. The thing that the cross does is it exposes the true condition of our heart. And we have to allow the cross to pierce us. To pierce through. Jesus was pierced in a number of different ways, wasn't he? His flesh was pierced when he was whipped. His head was pierced when they put the crown of thorns. His hands and his feet were pierced when he hung on the cross and his side was pierced after he died. All of that piercing wasn't done by accident. It was done to remind us of the sacrifice of Christ and what the cross does to us. Examining ourselves in the light of Christ and what it means. Let's take a look at verses 23 to 25. It says, but the mob shouted louder and louder. So Pilate's like, don't, he hasn't done anything wrong. But now it's a mob. It's no longer just a group of people that are trying to get justice. Demanding that Jesus be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded. As they had requested, he released Barabbas the man in prison for insurrection and murder. But he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. They turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. Doesn't matter. The cross pierces our pretenses. They weren't interested in justice. They were interested in revenge. He had taken something from them that they had spent their entire life building and they weren't about to give it up to some guy even if he was the son of God. When we come to the end of ourselves and our sin, when repentance is truly something that we've considered, we no longer make excuses for our behavior. We no longer make excuses for our sin. We admit our fault. We admit our sin and our fault and we admit that God's way is right and his plans are better and we admit that our pretenses are part of our sinful path. 
And we allow him to cut through all this clutter of trying to pretend to be better for other people. In a society that's all about image, we allow the cross to expose us. Why? Because that's what the cross does. That's what it does. It pierces our pretenses. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 11 says this, Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. And then the God of love and peace will be with you. How do you know if your heart is in the wrong place? You're probably not a person of harmony. You're probably not a person of peace. You're probably not a person who's acting in a mature way to the hardships around you. Paul says, test yourselves. Examine yourselves to see the genuineness of your faith, allowing God's sacrifice through Jesus Christ to pierce your soul. The final thing is the cross pierces our pride. Why was Jesus crucified between two thieves? I mean, one would be almost blind if they didn't see that there's a lesson that Jesus is teaching here. Jesus crucified, crucified between two thieves. He could have, been, could have been four, right? Could have been eight. Could have been 12. Could have been a whole number of them, right? Why, why just two? I mean, in the company of criminals, we get that. We get the understanding that Jesus is with the condemned, right? But why just two? You ever thought about that? I think it's because it's like this binary choice. I think it gives us a really good lesson. Are you going to choose thief number one? Or are you going to choose thief number two, right? Because we're all condemned. We're on the cross with Christ now. If we've admitted that we're sinners, and we admitted that we are suffering the death penalty because all of us, if we live long enough, will face death. None of us gets out of this life easy. It's always a hard end. Why? Because sin is in the world and we are all in sin. So we're all condemned to death. We all know this. We just don't talk about it very much in our society. But we're on that cross and we're hanging there. And now we've got a choice. We're going to hold on to our pride or are we going to trust in the one who died for us? If we pick it up and the crucifixion, actual the account of his crucifixion. It says in verse 38, 39, it says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. Oh, and us too while you're at it. This is the same thing that was being said by the Pharisees by the religious leaders, by the Roman guards and the Roman soldiers just two verses earlier. Luke 23, verse 37, they called out to him, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. So he's joining in. Does the world mock Christ? Sure it does. There's a version of Jesus that the world loves. You know, the loving Jesus, the rabbi that cares for people, the person that puts the little child on his knee. But are there teachings of Christ that offend? Jesus' teaching is, do not fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. That's words of Jesus. Same Jesus who said, suffer the little children not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Which one does the world like to hear? They like to hear the story of the little children. They don't want to hear the story about him who is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. What is Jesus talking about? He's saying, I know what's actually the real deal. I know where you're headed. And I know what you actually need to be saved from. Jesus said, I choose this death and I lay aside my glory. Now, Jesus didn't have pride like we do. But if anybody had the right to be proud, it would be Jesus, right? But he laid aside all of his glory. and took on a human body and lived a sinless life and allowed himself to suffer the indignity of a mock trial and a murderous mob and being pierced through his hands and his feet and nailed to a cross naked and have people laugh at him and mock him and 
glory in his suffering and death. He chose this. How can we, who claim to follow Christ, or if we claim to follow Christ, have any sense of like, I'm better than somebody else? Who are we? We're condemned like those criminals on the cross. But this one criminal, he started out mocking. He had joined in. But then as he hung there and he started to think about his state, and he realized that he's going to die, something changed in his heart. And he laid aside his pride and he laid it down. And then he said these famous words in verses 41 and 42. He said, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. What does he say? He admits he's wrong. He says, we deserve to die for our crimes. Have you ever said that to God? Have you ever said to God, I deserve to die for my crimes against you? Do you actually believe that? Or are you like the other one, going like, why don't you just save me, okay? I don't really have much to be uh, that shameful for. Sin. I don't really deserve this. These men didn't say that. This man, I should say, didn't say that. He said, we deserve to die for our crimes. This is what the cross does, is it pierces our pride. There is no place for pride on the cross. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. God doesn't have to answer to anything about anything to me. I don't worship Jesus because of the stuff he gives me, about how much I think I can get monetarily or health-wise or relationship-wise or career-wise. No, no, no. The only reason I worship him is because he's worthy. He didn't do anything wrong. I know I have a lot of questions about the way he works. I know I have a lot of questions about life. I know I have a question about how things have worked out sometimes. I know I have a question about the pain that I've experienced, but I'm not blaming Jesus. I know where this comes from. And then, this is the beautiful part. He doesn't say, and by the way, what 12 things do I need to do in order to get right with you? Because he can't do anything. He's just hanging there. He's going to die. A horrible death. So what does he say? He just says to Jesus these simple words. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Put your eye on me. I believe in you. It's that simple, and yet it's that difficult. It's so simple, a child can do it. It's so hard that the most gifted, intellectual, rich, wealthy, famous person can't seem to bring themselves to do it. Why? Because it's an act of submission, and it's an act of humility. The cross pierces all of these things, our plans, our presumptions, our pretenses, and our pride, I want to ask you this morning, have you allowed the cross to pierce you? Does it still pierce you? The communion table is what we celebrate. The Lord's shed blood and broken body on Good Friday. But this is a time for us to get our hearts right with the Lord. Maybe even holding on to something. Maybe you've been presuming something about God. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been bitter. Maybe you've been doubtful. Maybe you've never surrendered your heart to the Lord, but this morning you want to. Repentance is very, very simple and is profound. It means admitting without reservation that my way is wrong and God's way is right. Admitting that my way is going to hell and his way is going to heaven and I'm done with trying to do it my way. I'm done with trying to live my life my way. I'm done with trying to hold on to these things. I'm letting the cross pierce them and nail them there for good. And when I allow that to happen, I can share in the death of Christ. And when he kills those things, he puts to death my sinful nature. 
He puts to death those selfish desires. They're nailed to the cross. And the new life that I have in Christ, I can celebrate on Easter. Why? Because now I share in his resurrection. Have you shared in his death? Have you allowed the cross to pierce you? I want to pray as we prepare for the Lord's table. Let's do that. Father, I am a sinner. I am a sinner who has been saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. So there's nothing to boast about. I ask that you would forgive me of my plans that I've been making on my own and the presumptions I've had about what you should do for me and need to do for me and the timelines that I put on it at times. I ask that you would forgive me for my pretenses where I pretended to be righteous all the while not being serious or trying to cover over my sin rather than admit my fault. I ask that you would forgive me for my pride. Lord, the life that I have can only be found in you. I, I ask that you would nail my sin to the cross. Allow your cross to pierce my heart, my soul. And may you put to death the old man, the old woman. And may you bring newness of life in Jesus. Father, I ask that you would forgive me. I trust in you. I believe in you. I ask that you would come and set up your, your, your residence in my heart. May your kingdom come through me. May the life I live be in faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I give my life to you. I thank you for the cross. And as we celebrate this morning, I ask that as a forgiven child who has nothing to offer just like that thief other than faith in you, that you would make me clean. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we partake of the Lord's table today, we have a tradition in our church of coming forward. And so I'm gonna ask that you would come forward in two lines, one way this way and one way this way, and then exit through the center and then have your seats again. And then we will partake together from the bread and the wine after you're seated.
I believe the symbolism of the Easter season is important for us to remember because the symbolism of the Easter season is something that touches our life throughout the rest of the year. We have these special celebrations, right? And we have a cross that we can see all the time. We don't often see maybe nails as often or a crown of thorns or a robe. But we remember those things and they do touch our hearts. And as the Lord's pierced our hearts today, I want us to remember something. The Bible tells us that when we're saved, we are completely saved. The Bible tells us that once the blood has washed away our sin, that we are as white as snow. The Bible tells us that there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, it's not a death that he has to die again and again. It's once and for all. And when he was broken for our sin, he was broken so that you and I might be made whole. He was broken so that you and I might be able to celebrate that we have new life, that we have daily sustenance, that we have all that we need that pertains to life and godliness. So when we celebrate the communion table, it's not just our heads down and we're sad about what happened, but we celebrate because today is Friday, but we put a descriptor at the beginning of it, right? What's it called? Good Friday, right? It is a good day. And often we've said it's good for us, but bad for him. It was bad for him, and yet it was good because it was his good and perfect gift. It came from above, from the Father himself. And Jesus did this willingly. He did this because he desired to do it because of his love for us. So as we partake of the Lord's broken body for us, let's remember what he said this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then there's this cup. And it's called covenant, right? What's a covenant? It's more than a promise. It's an unconditional promise. It's not a contract. It's way more than that. It's God's unconditional promise to us. And you know who the Holy Spirit is? Third person of the Godhead. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, that he is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until he comes to take his purchased possession to be with him the security that we have in Christ. When you've received the deposit of the Holy Spirit, he is both with you and within you. He is a guarantee of your salvation. There is no condemnation any longer. And so the life that we live, we live by faith in the Son of God, right? How ought we to live every morning we wake up? Old man, old woman, or new man or new woman? Which one of those? We make a choice to live according to the new man or new woman. We don't blame our circumstances. We don't blame our, our, our weak. We are lifted up high. The life that we have in Christ is new. And we act as new because of the faith that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we remember Jesus' words, he says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now in our church, we have a benevolent offering that we have opportunity to give every time we have communion. If you would like to give to the benevolent offering, you can put uh, an envelope or some money in the back box in our church. If you don't want to do it that way, you can give electronically as well and just put in the memo. You can say, for benevolent offering, as a sign of our appreciation to the Lord and caring for those that are the least of these. 
We're going to sing a final song, and then we'll close the service. Let's stand together.
prayed with us and maybe you would like to talk further, um, we'd love to talk to you, our elders as well. Uh, they normally come forward for communion, but we forgot the mics this morning. So Jerry, raise your hand up high. Don, raise your hand up high. There's our elders. You can come and speak to us as well. If you made a decision for Christ, if you've opened your heart up to the Lord, we want to follow up with you as well. We know that these are special times and special services, and uh, we're always here available for you. We want to remind you of our celebration service Easter Sunday morning. It's on Sunday, of course, at 10 o'clock, but we also have, cue the next slide, an Easter breakfast. And there's a QR code there. We'll leave it up for a bit. Why? Because if you want to go there, you can still register to bring food. If you forgot to bring food, please come and bring a guest because we've got lots of extra food. People are bringing lots of uh, awesome stuff. We've had a lot of people sign up already. So at 845 is our breakfast. 10 o'clock in the morning is our celebration service. May God bless you. May he keep you in his grace. And we pray that the Lord Jesus will go with you as we share his love with a world that needs to hear. Amen. Take care and God bless. If there are a few people who can spare like five or 10 minutes to help Colleen set up the tables and chairs down in the